Well, thank you very much, Cynthia. Uh, I'm back again. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to talk about something that's very high-minded in many ways. It's something that perhaps many of you already think about. Um, I'm thinking about how might it be possible to improve the quality of the work that patrol officers, patrol officers perform in their everyday encounters with the public. So what we're talking about is, is how do you assess how well someone does something rather than how much work they perform. And this is something that's very challenging to do, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, police departments probably don't do a very good job of doing it, and universities probably do a, a worse job. So I'm not pointing fingers here. And this is not to say, of course, that there's no focus on work quality when assessing officer performance. I know this is already a component of many of your annual performance appraisals, because I've had the opportunity to look through some. <laughs> And I even looked through my wife's from the federal government to try and make sense of it. So what I am saying is that concerns about quality and attempts to improve it tend to get crowded out by an over-reliance on quantitative indicators, number of arrests that an officer makes, number, number of traffic citations that they write. And what is available when we think about quality and offer advice is, is often in the form of platitudes or fairly simplistic advice, you know, watch a suspect's eyes. Look at their belt buckle to see which way they're going to turn, uh, as someone told me. Use street smarts. Uh, be alert, right? Uh, and I think this suggests to me, at least, that we can do more to contribute to a more comprehensive view of those aspects of police performance that we can think of, if you like, as the craft uh, of policing. And we can do this in order to figure out how to improve them. So I think we can all recognize that patrol work can be demanding and officers of course have a great deal of leeway or discretion in deciding what to do so patrol work at least if it is to be done well requires careful thought and good judgment uh, sometimes under as you all know uh, quite difficult circumstances and officers of course don't have the luxury of time like armchair academics who can sit back and, 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 and make judgments and do Monday morning quarterbacking and we also know that as supervisors, uh, with a multitude of responsibilities, Hi, we're doing? often unable to observe an officer's performance firsthand, right? And to judge whether they made the best choice compared to available alternatives. So my question for you, which I want you to think about as I've tried to think about it as well, and I'm still thinking about it, is, is how can we go about improving the knowledge, skills, and judicious performance of patrol officers in order to advance the craft of policing? Now, I can't stand up here and claim to be an expert. I don't have some cookie-cutter recipe that's going to solve uh, all our problems in trying to figure out how to measure quality. Uh, but what I hope is that today I plant a seed in your head, something that hopefully will, uh, uh, will grow uh, and, and make you think a little bit about some ways you could adapt perhaps some of these ideas that we talk about today. And I'll be showing you a clip to give you an illustration of how this might work in practice. You might take it back to your own department and mull over how you might think about improving the craft of police work carried out by your own patrol officers. So this is an evidence-based conference, so I will draw on some empirical research that I've been doing along with my colleague sitting in the front row here, Steve Mastrowski, and you'll be hearing more from him. And I'll be using uh, some quotes and interviews and surveys from one particular police agency. So I can say that what we're trying to do here uh, is sort of meld research and practice. Uh, to come up with some kind of presentation or something useful that is both practitioner-oriented uh, as well as uh, evidence-based. So just real quick, uh, when I talk about quality, because it's a rather sort of abstract term, I'm asking us to consider the question, did an officer do the right thing? <coughs> right? Now, this is impossible to know for certain, of course, because most of what we have to go on is only observable at the scene. And we don't know the long-term consequences of an officer's decision. But we can see what happens, at least in the short term, uh, of the officer's decision. Still, why should we particularly care about quality? And I think there are two reasons. Patrol officers themselves have long thought of what they do as a craft. And they care very much about how well it is done, and they judge each other accordingly. Well, what about another reason to attend to work quality? Well, if we really care about improving police performance, which is what I think we probably all care about, then reform efforts are unlikely to succeed unless they take into account the insights of those who actually do the work at the street level and their understanding of what good policing is all about. And I'll be able to share with you 
what the patrol officers that we interviewed thought was good policing in reference to a particular video clip. And secondly, members of the public care very much about how they're treated by the police, right? We'll hear more about this uh, within a procedural justice framework today from, from Steve Mastrowski. People might not know much about the crime rate in this city, but as I'm sure you'd all agree, they have little difficulty in forming judgments about their encounters with the police and then in expressing them if they have to. But this is evidence-based, so you might be sitting there a little skeptical and say, well, my patrol officers don't really care about quality, right? So here's some uh, evidence from the survey that we did. And in our survey, and this is of all those who were assigned to pat the patrol bureau in one agency, 61% indicated that less weight should be given to quantity than quality. And only 7% preferred that more weight be given to quantity than quality. So quality clearly ranks very highly in these officers' minds. Great. Right? But what we also learn, right, is that measuring quality is very difficult, and patrol officers themselves recognize this. In the slide you see here, slightly more officers agreed, 43%, than disagreed, 40%, that in handling difficult situations with the public, there were not many general principles useful in promoting good policing, but rather what constitutes good police work, as I'm sure many of you would agree, depends on the particular dynamics of the situation. Only about 36% of the officers that we surveyed agreed that tactics that work well for one officer will work well for another officer. And the vast majority, 72%, agreed that making judgments about an officer's performance required being actually on the scene to observe exactly what the officer is facing. So what this tells us is that patrol officers tend to agree that quality of performance should be the dominant consideration on performance appraisals but that it's also very difficult to make judgments about that quality, right? So our, our work is going to be cut out for us. So I think we can make the case that quality matters, but we also now know that what constitutes good police work depends heavily on the particular circumstances of a given situation. So an approach that might work well in one type of situation, the one I'm going to show you today, say a sort of non-violent domestic dispute, might be, might be disastrous in another situation, such as a barroom brawl. Okay, so the implication here is that the only way forward for us in trying to identify standards for assessing quality is not to talk in general or abstract terms. I'm not going to get anywhere by doing that, but to discuss the subtle particulars of a given situation. And so to help us here, I'm going to show you a, a short video clip of a real-life situation. It's about eight minutes long, and it's the same clip that we showed to patrol officers and we ask them to judge the performance of the officers in the clip. We ask a number of different questions. So I'm going to ask you to do the same. So when you watch this clip, you might think about globally, is this good or bad performance? And then if you really want to challenge yourself, you might think about, well, are there some criteria that I could come up with that would allow me to evaluate these officers' performance in the clip? Now, the clip starts quickly. It's pretty bad quality. It's from the New, York, New York City in the 1970s, so it's pretty grainy and dated, so you have to bear with me. Of course, in your own departments, you could probably find better clips, especially now with the emerging uh, use of body cameras. It might be that you have lots of available clips that you could use. Just to set it up, this is a dispute between two neighbors with a, a fairly low threat uh, of immediate violence. And you, it starts quickly. You're going to have to li listen carefully. I'm going to see if I can turn down the light. Uh, well, why don't we ask, we, we did a number of things, uh, but uh, uh, so I always get distracted by those gentlemen's moustaches, obviously, <laughs> just amazing. Um, okay, so, uh, so you might ask yourself, uh, is this good or bad performance? So if you had to give this a score, right, overall score from 0 to 10, with 10 being highly skilled performance and 0 being not skilled at all, this is one of the questions that, that we asked. Who, would anyone give this a 10? Would anyone give it a, a 0 or a 1? OK. Are people thinking a 5? Can, can I have a show of hands for a 5? Sort of, OK, we've got a couple. People are a little hesitant. So somewhere in the middle. OK. So this is, we had a sample of 38 officers. And you can see that there's a fair, uh, a fair amount of variation, right? There's someone who's like, hell yeah, that was good policing, <laughs> right? Uh, a couple at the bottom, oh, hell no, right? And some that sort of ca catch the temperature in the room, sort of in the middle, right? It's, it's, it's kind of a five, OK? Um, now, it's not really surprising if you think about it, because 
people, patrol officers are going to be focusing on different things in terms of that encounter, and this is what made the interviews kind of interesting. Some will see, well, they're very polite and, and patient, so I would give them a higher score, while others might have a different criteria for success, criterion for success and give them a, a much uh, lower score. So um, I think a harder question is, is, well, if you were trying to give advice about quality, I mean, telling an officer this is a six, and then giving them some vague explanation for why that is, that would be very challenging to improve that office perform officer's performance. What might be a little bit more helpful is to, can you come up with some criteria, right? So you could say, well, perhaps they did well on some dimensions and not so well on, on the other. Now, based on the police literature, and this is some of the work of Steve Mastrovsky and some other well-known uh, police scholars, these dimensions seem to matter, and these seem to be fairly general and apply to a lot of uh, encounters. And which was somewhat reassuring because when we interviewed officers, they came up with very similar criteria as well as scholars who had really just made their judgments based upon their own experience and observation. So I, I can't spend an awful lot of time going through them, and I'll focus mainly on the top two, but these were the kinds of things that came up in the interviews when we said, well, you know, is this good performance? You know, how would you judge it? Well, problem diagnosis, right? Do they take enough time and the necessary steps to produce an accurate diagnosis of the situation at hand? And if you couldn't hear, this was a case of a, a lady who had retaliated for the other woman slamming her door, and she'd been banging the other lady's door with a, with a, with a flat iron. Citizen satisfaction, doing what you can to make sure people feel their problem has been taken seriously, they've been treated fairly, and that there is an outcome that uh, can be at least regarded as satisfactory. Problem resolution. I think some people were chortling away, as, as I have when I've watched the clip, that it didn't really seem to get resolved in any way, in any sort of definitive way. Um, that was something that came up in the interviews. Did they engage with a lawful uh, response, right? Making sure your actions conform to the law. Um, people's safety. Did they attempt to minimize harm or injury to themselves or others and not make the situation more dangerous, right? Or, or sort of raise the tension level. Safety and order at the scene, diffusing situations, making sure they don't get more volatile, and economy. And this is a tough one for patrol officers. How much time do you spend? This was an eight-minute eight, eight clip. They spend eight minutes. Is that enough or is that not enough? And oftentimes, guidance doesn't uh, come on that. So just in the interest of time, I'll focus on the first part. And I, I felt like if I was trying to explain to a prob uh, patrol officer what problem diagnosis is, I would have to say more than, well, you have to diagnose the problem. So this is just a working definition that I came up with a little bit of thought, and you could change it. It's in your, in your workbook, right? Using available resources, including the parties involved, to conduct a broad inquiry into the specific nature of the problem. Many of the officers we spoke to kind of felt like they didn't do enough to probe, to really figure out what, you know, they were sort of baffled why the second lady was so upset that she'd gone through the steps of trying to destroy uh, the other person's door. Um, so... Um, both, based on our interviews, respondents were generally pleased that the officers spoke to both parties, but they were much more dissatisfied that the officers didn't ask more questions. And so some of the things that came up in the interviews were like, they should have consulted the call history of the addresses, or contacted the building manager personally to see if this was an ongoing issue. issue sorry. A lot of the officers in one department and not in another that we did this thought it was appropriate to contact mental health services uh, for the, because of the second lady's behavior, although I've talked to other people who've watched the clip who feel like she's just very strong-willed. There's not necessarily anything unstable about her. Or maybe go into that second lady's apartment to try and get a sense of her mental health by looking at where she lives. And in terms of the seriousness of the dispute, I mean, what was the nature of the threat? What was said exactly? To what extent did the complainant feel threatened? These would be important things uh, to figure out. And one officer said that sort of captures many of these quite nicely. I, I try to get a better sense of what caused this dispute. What time was the door slamming occurring? Why specifically was it causing so much anger? Did the second woman work nights and it was waking her up? Was the dispute only about door slamming or was it something uh, much deeper? Some said they must have been friends. They seemed to know each other. How long had the dispute been going on? Was there evidence that this was actually escalating? Now, this is an interesting slide, I thought, because this is a slide that, that when we asked officers about what do you think causes undesirable results when you have interactions uh, with the public. And so our interview results on the importance of problem identification and other aspects of good, good performance that we heard in our in interviews was consistent with our survey. But also on the survey, and this was Steve's idea, was the idea that we didn't want to assume that what produces undesirable outcomes is simply the opposite of what produces desirable outcomes. So we asked respondents 
when a patrol officer's decision or actions with the public produce undesirable results, which one of each of the following pairs is more often the cause of those undesirable results? And then we gave a bunch of pairs. I'll give you some illustrations here. I won't go through all of them. Some of the pairs were the officer did not gather information from enough sources. The officer gathered information from too many sources. Or the officer took too much time overall dealing with the situation. The officer did not take enough time overall dealing with the situation. And what these results show, as you can tell, at least in the minds of the patrol officers that we spoke to, is that trouble comes when patrol officers are not sufficiently deliberate, right? particularly when it comes to identifying the nature of the problem, failing to seek enough information from enough sources, not taking enough time, right? not considering enough alternatives to solve the problem, and not seeking enough citizen input. Okay? And the majority of officers, as you can see from this, from this um, bar chart, um, agreed on these items. How am I doing for time? OK. Let me just go back, because this is going to come up as well. Uh, I'd mentioned that another uh, criterion would be perhaps treatment of citizens. And this comes up in this slide, too. Um, another thing that showed up in the interviews again and again was the high degree of consensus about concerns uh, to attend to procedural justice issues. And we'll hear more about this later. Fair and respectful treatment uh, of members of the public. Um, and we could think about this more broadly in terms of citizen treatment. And all four of the items on this bar chart here dealing with treatment of citizens show that officers were sensitive to the risks involved in failing to attend to them. So gathering sufficient information is also a display of your commitment to fairness, right? Because you want to hear all sides. Or giving citizens an explanation of officers' decisions talks to transparency. This is why we're going to do this under these circumstances. Avoiding a harsh demeanor, self-explanatory, and allowing citizens an opportunity to provide input into the decision process. OK, so the last slide. You know, I, I actually spent a lot of time uh, looking at performance appraisal literature, which is something I'm not familiar with, and uh, is much more complicated than I realized. And I looked at some of your old uh, performance appraisals, and I really wanted to come up with a performance appraisal instrument that would capture all of this, but I realized it was way beyond my abilities, uh, at no matter how much I tried. But here are some ideas that uh, you might think about uh, taking with you that won't demand this kind of stuff being turned into a formal appraisal instrument. So how can you motivate and improve patrol officer performance? Well, perhaps you could show clips like this one, right, in, in fairly common situations, like traffic situations, or situations where it's difficult to know what to do, which is why we showed this clip. To us, at least, it felt like, you know, what's the right thing to do here, right? It's not that obvious. Uh, and this was an example of a domestic dispute where there was no visible signs of violence. And you could have a seminar format where people were shown the video and have to talk about it, right? Have to deliber deliberate about what highly skilled performance would look like, right, in these kinds of disputes. And the police chief could be involved, uh, first line supervisors, right? People that have a vision for what good policing should look like. And then it'd be a process of deliberation and discussion of differences where any evidence that's relevant could also be introduced. If a scholar was in the room, they could help with that. And you could debate the merits of different approaches. Uh, it won't be an easy process, but it might be, as you can see from coming up with these criteria, it is possible to reach some kind of agreement about what matters. And it might be possible to reach a, a consensus. Um, and if you're really ambitious, you could come up with some kind of formal uh, assessment tool. Another approach would be to organize regular meetings where patrol officers get to share and discuss their experiences in handling situations that they find particularly challenging. Kind of a, a space to talk about things like this. I stuck with this really hard incident today. Didn't, you know, the woman just wouldn't refuse to listen. I was trying to figure out what to do. And you could talk about what worked well and not so well. And officers could benefit from feedback from their peers. Creating this kind of uh, constructive and supportive environment could help promote a culture of work quality rather than work quantity, where the complexity of everyday patrol work is formally recognized, and officers are given an opportunity to think about how to do work better rather than just how to do more. If you think about it, medicine uses the clinical case reviews as a mechanism to foster continuous quality improvement. The military uses after action reviews to promote lessons learned. And the Federal Aviation Authority uses sort of a non-punitive reporting system to strengthen a culture of safety. So you're trying to build a dynamic here which allows people to talk about these things and think about difficult issues about quality. 
Now, whatever the obstacles to assessing quality in police encounters with the public, and there are many, I hope this presentation goes some way to convincing you that much could be gained by those of you in this room who are bold enough to take on this challenge. So, thanks very much. Oh, you can answer that. Thank you, Jim. Warm welcome.